Good afternoon. Welcome to the Twin Cities. I'm Sylvia Strobel from the Junior League of St. Paul, and I sit and I sit on the AJLI Board of Directors. We're here today to celebrate a very, very special woman. The Mary Harriman Community Leadership Award is the most prestigious honor we bestow upon an individual league member. We award it to someone who has set herself apart by championing a better future for her community. The Mary Harriman Award reminds us all of what we, as individuals, can accomplish for our leagues, our communities, and the Junior League movement. When we are not limited by doubts, but empowered by confidence in our ability to make a difference. And speaking of outstanding individual members, I want to take a moment to welcome our next chapter delegates. The next chapter is a conference within a conference, specifically Junior League sustainers, including many AJLI past governance leaders. We are so proud that you chose to be with us here in the Twin Cities. Could you all please stand? Among the next chapter delegates are five AJLI past presidents. Deborah Britton, Sandy Chemish May, Deli Beekman, Tony Freeman, and Ellen Rose. We are grateful to you for your continued guidance and wisdom. Thank you. Now please enjoy lunch and I'll return to the stage shortly. I hate to interrupt your conversation. But we have some important work ahead of us. If history is measured by its headlines, a future junior leaguer might look back at 2017 as a moment of deep division in politics, in culture, faith, and in our very own backyards. It would be easy to look at the challenges we face today as global citizens and feel a sense of disillusionment, even powerlessness. But there are some of us, like this year's winner of the Mary Harriman Community Impact Award, that remind us of who we are and what we are truly capable of accomplishing. Over 100 years ago, America was pushing the envelope to define what its future would be, to lift itself out of its hard-won, horse-drawn beginnings into a time of innovation and abundance while at the same time ignoring the core principles that make us human, graciousness, respect, and charity. Where others saw apathy and inevitability, Mary Harriman saw an opportunity to evolve as a society as a whole. It was this turbulent soup of change that forced us to take a hard look at who we wanted to be as Americans and what a truly industrious modern society should look like. Suzanne Plissick might say that 2017 doesn't appear at all that different from 1901. Where Mary had thrown her heart and soul into the settlement movement, a defining issue of the time, Suzanne has brought that same level of passion and rigor to one of the most difficult issues of today, our country's enduring and increasingly complicated racial divide. Suzanne represents that rare quality that you find in true change makers, the will to dig deep. And for Suzanne, that starts with asking the tough questions. When Suzanne looks at the biases and injustices that have become commonplace, she isn't asking how we got there or what we're getting wrong, but rather, why are we allowing it to continue? And that might be the toughest question of all because it doesn't assume that a system is broken or even a society at large. It asks us to look at what's broken in each and every one of us. But identifying the problem is just the beginning. The next question we have to ask is how do we go about mending it? As junior league members, we know that results start with doing. 
finding a challenge we can get our hands around, and collaborating with other dedicated hearts and minds to achieve a common goal. When Suzanne joined the Junior League of Greensboro, North Carolina in 1982, she was presented with exactly that opportunity. The most pressing concern at that time was the merger of three school systems, Guilford County Schools, Greensboro City Schools, and High Point City Schools. Suzanne was appointed to serve on a committee responsible for studying the potential merger and identifying the challenges it would face. As with any large-scale change, the merger was met with passionate opposition from various constituents. It wasn't until 1993 when the school systems finally merged that Suzanne's careful and sensitive work was felt across the board, from improved district-wide academic scores to boosted morale among teachers. The new district has since become a model for other schools around the country looking to adopt strategies for success in the face of overcrowding and tightening budgets. Through her experiences with the Junior League, Suzanne developed a keen interest in racial bias and institutional racism in education, healthcare, and criminal justice. Suzanne believes that each one of us can influence public policy by studying the racial bias that impacts all systems, from the achievement gap in education to disparate outcomes in healthcare to the differences we see in law enforcement interaction. Suzanne has committed herself to guiding others to address racism as the root cause of many issues facing our society today. Her work on the Public Affairs Committee has influenced other junior league members to get involved in public policy and advocacy work, help, helping to lead letter writing campaigns and teaching members how to effectively communicate with city and state officials. Suzanne has spoken at a number of workshops, including the National Women's Political Caucus, the North Carolina Women's Political Caucus, and the National Association of Educators of Young Children. And she served as our very own president of the Association of Junior Leagues from 1990 to 1992. We're excited and grateful to have Suzanne with us today as the recipient of the 2017 Mary Harriman Award. Please join me in congratulating Suzanne Plissick, the 2017 winner of the Mary Harriman Community Leadership Award. If Mary Harriman and Suzanne Plissick had been contemporaries, they certainly would have found a way to form a relationship with one another. Just as Mary Harriman was a leader among her friends, Suzanne has challenged and continues to challenge the way we address problems in our community and beyond. Many years ago, Suzanne distinguished herself as a community volunteer, but she continued to question the traditional problem-solving approach in Greensboro. As she explains, we have the habit of asking why one time and quickly creating a solution. Suzanne advocates for change at a root cause level, Without systemic change, she believes we are destined to fall short in our work as direct service providers. Just as Mary Harriman believed that a group of women could bring their influence and energy to the settlement movement, Suzanne believes that we can all influence public policy by learning about the racial bias that impacts all systems, the achievement gap in education, disparate outcome in health care, and differences in law enforcement interaction. Suzanne guides others to address racism as the root cause of many issues facing our community. As Mary Harriman needed to learn more about the plight of immigrants to America, she sought experts to speak to her newly formed organization. Mary Harriman and Suzanne Plissick shared this need for learning about issues. Suzanne says, the ability to learn is a gift like no other. You know, it was the most wonderful time of my life. Uh, it was camaraderie, it was friendship, it was being a part of something bigger than you were. My friends then were from across the country. I still meet every year, sometimes twice a year, with a group of us who were very close, who became very close. We have been there through all our children's weddings, through the birth of all our grandchildren. It has, that has been, you know, lasting friendship just lasting friendship. People very like-minded, it's, it's, it's marvelous because so many of those women with whom I, I remain close 
are doing the kind of similar things. Uh, they, they did so many important things in their communities, and that's been a gift. I mean, that's just been a gift to, to have that lasting long-term friendship. The association board also, at the time, we had an office in Washington. We had a lobbyist in Washington. You know, we were on the Hill when the Americans with Disability Act passed. We were on the Hill for the uh, Civil Rights Restoration Act. Those were exciting times doing important work. Um, we testified before Congress often then. And that, that has, has impacted me greatly. Um, I've really, through that work, through that public policy work, and seeing uh, the difference that, that organizations can make in those public policy initiatives, really took me to the next place of that. It really took me to the work I do today, without question. I am a community organizer and racial equity trainer. I am partner in the Racial Equity Institute, which is a training and organizing organization. Actually, it's a partnership. It's a for-profit partnership. And we work across the United States with groups that want to impact racial inequity, either in their organization or in their community. And so we work with everybody from police to departments of social services to small nonprofit organizations to civic groups or to local organizers, people who have just come together to impact their community, who say that it's really not okay that children of color have the outcomes that they have today. Suzanne Plissick is a very loyal friend. She is someone that has high standards and high principles. She is uncompromising. She is very diligent and very patient and very no-nonsense about what she believes in. There are visionaries among us all the time. They're often not heard. And it's important to hear them and to seek them out. They're probably some right now in the league. I met Suzanne in the early 2000s, and Suzanne was a part of uh, the Partnership Project. And it was a local nonprofit organization here that was doing the work organizing for the Undoing Racism workshops that were being held at the time. And I was recruited by Suzanne's colleague, Nettie Code, to go to the workshop. I was a human relations commissioner. I was not excited about going to the workshop. I thought I was, you know, um, you know, just someone who's very aware of racial issues, thought I was doing some level of the work. And so I went, I went out of respect for Nettie who really wanted me to go. Suzanne was one of my trainers and she remembers my hesitancy and, you know, maybe a little attitude that I came in the room with. And um, so that's, that's how we got together, that she was the trainer um, in the training that I was hesitant to go to. And I stuck with it. I just kept coming back. It just changed my life in such profound ways that I wanted to go through it again. I wanted to hear it again. And it just resonated with me in a way. And so I, I hung out and we continued to work together and organize and show up at the same meetings over and over again. And it... If you're not getting pushback, you're not doing it. Someone like Suzanne, there's a particular prototype of uh, older white people in this movement, and Suzanne's not one of them. You know, I, as a matter of fact, we use her position uh, with the Junior League in our workshop. And, um, you know, we often say, you know, Suzanne's a former past president of the International Junior League, and, and she looks like it. <laughs> and, um, and she's not the type of person. You know, that's not the type of um, sort of history and background that you see doing justice work at that level, the grassroots and the grass tops level. Suzanne is such a gift to this work. She's such a gift to this community. She has, she has made enormous sacrifices to do what she does. I have heard some of her friends say that I don't know if I could sacrifice what she sacrificed. I don't know if I could pay the social and civic cost 
the distancing that's occurred because of the position that Suzanne has taken. And she gives people some leadership. She gives someone, she gives people someone to look to, to look up to, um, and to be able to follow. And without that leadership, um, there's a big vacuum, there's a big hole in this work uh, for justice and for equity and access. Greensboro has an interesting history, and I think most cities and most states like to highlight and lift up uh, their recent <laughs> efforts to uh, be inclusive. What we don't often do is look at our history of being exclusive. And since our origins, since in the 1800s that Greensboro um, struggled with, with race like our country did, and that went on for more than a century and a half. And we, so what, what I would say about our city and how it mirrors the rest of the United States is that we have a much longer history of racial conflict and racial struggle than we do of racial uh, inclusion and embracing that. Well, I think one of the main qualities that um, Suzanne brings to leadership is her ability to sit back quietly while people express their opinions, um, have an, a, a room that's open for anybody to say what they need to say, but then she um, will step in with a very uh, cogent, pulled together um, analysis and, and bring out the important points. I can only say that if I could uh, do half of what Suzanne's done to uh, improve our community and to bring an anti-racism analysis to people in our community, I would feel successful. Uh, I find that there are lots of people who are animated around issues, but the way in which they give and commit, connect and commit to those issues is to the degree that they can remain comfortable inside of who they are. I am I would say especially impressed that Suzanne has, has, has allowed herself to become uh, uncomfortable and what uh, one author, uh, Margaret Wheatley, would say, willing to be so disturbed by this issue that she has in uh, uh, some of the most significant ways uh, that we could speak of, committed her energy, committed her time, and committed her talents to this. Suzanne says she would not be where she is today without the Junior League of Greensboro and AJLI. Suzanne embodies the mission of the Junior League of Greensboro. She is really, truly a change agent for our community. We are grateful to have her in our community as a leader, in our state, and in our country. Suzanne truly embodies what the Mary Harriman Award is. We are so thrilled that she's being honored. I have a lot of faith in the league and in women. And I don't think we have experienced a time in the world where women's leadership was more needed than it is right now. Now it is my honor to welcome this year's Mary Harriman Community Leadership Award winner, Suzanne Plissick. I always say that uh, one of the greatest gifts of Junior League is to uh, be able to meet, work, and admire a truly incredible woman, women, and uh, it was my pleasure to serve as uh, 
president-elect when Susan was AJLI president, so it's a great honor to have you here. And uh, she, she was an incredible president that actually fits our theme this year because she did disrupt convention and facilitated the partnership project for this organization which drastically changed the culture. So, thank you. We also have, Suzanne, a special gift besides the tray <laughs> to you from Laura Otis, who is the uh, Junior League of Jacksonville member and owner of Laurel Lively, a very special favorite Junior League person. And uh, we have an extra gift for you. Welcome. Thank you. thank you, Susan. You are an inspiration to all of us, and thank you for being a role model to Junior League members everywhere. Like Mary Harriman, you have been guided through our life by an extraordinary sense of social responsibility and have leveraged your abundant abilities to be a catalyst for the improvement of your community, changing the landscaping and its people forever. We are privileged to have you as a member of our organization and congratulations to the delegates of the Junior League of Greensboro who join us in this celebration. It's also wonderful that your husband, Tom, was able to join us today. It's your turn now. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Thank you. I am truly honored and I am humbled. It is my prayer as the song goes that my work will speak for me, but it's amazing to be honored for this work. There are many others more praiseworthy. You listed a lot of things that I have been a part of. Um, and there are many people who could stand here with me for each of those things. I want to first acknowledge that the work I do, like the work you do, by the way, I've been given four minutes and I'm going to take every one of them. like the work you do, has required sacrifices, and they have not just been mine to make. They have been my families and my friends and those wonderful anti-racist organizers in the Racial Equity Institute, my partner, Dina Hayes Green, and the Guilford Anti-Racist Alliance as well. But most importantly, I must recognize the one chief among those making sacrifices my husband of 47 years, Tom Plissick. <laughs> whose dedication to me and to the justice we both love cannot be calculated. Thank you, love. I know it was not your intent to end up with an anti-racist organizer. <laughs> We have two perfect sons, Mac and Thomas, by the way, and four perfect grandchildren, um, which I just will throw in there quickly. I, I also want to recognize my beloved league. I can't rec I'm not going to recognize everyone here from my league, but I must recognize the Junior League of Greensboro, one of the happiest, most rewarding times of my life. And I want to recognize two of their, our courageous leaders, Carly Swain and Kelly McKee. Would you just stand up, ladies?
And of course, I have to recognize the Association of Junior Leagues International, where I learned so much, often painfully, <laughs> but often joyfully, but most especially Ann Dalton, who taught me everything I know about public policy, but beyond that, a great deal of what I know about integrity and a great deal about staying the course. Now, recognition's given, I want to tell you a secret. Really, I want to share my secret with 600 plus people, it appears. Um, I do not do the work I do only because white household median net worth in 2011 was 20 times that of people of color, according to Pew Research. Or because people of color die of heart disease much more commonly than whites despite availability of prevention measures. Or because white women who haven't finished high school have a lower rate of infant mortality than black women with college and graduate degrees. When we know in group, education predicts outcome. Or because whites are more likely to violate drug laws, according to the Centers for Disease Control, seven to 10 times more likely than people of color. And yet it is black and brown men sent to prison on drug charges at rates 20 to 50 times greater in some states than white men, even when the, the offense is the same. These data are but a fraction of the data available today, and they represent a racial disparity in this nation of unconscionable proportions. This must change. This must change. And yet I must tell you my secret is for whom I do this work. And it is not for all of those things. It is for me. And it is for you. Racism is the one form of oppression with the power to destroy us all. And racial equity is good for everyone. To ignore our place in these outcomes and these disparities is analogous to saying your end of the boat is sinking. We must know that we're all in the boat. Our destinies are inextricably linked. Our end of the boat will eventually sink. Our very humanity is at stake ladies. Will it diminish that humanity if we don't care, if we don't act, if we don't challenge the lies of our history and of our time, if we don't know and tell the truth that everyone matters, if we don't fight for justice and an end to racial disparity? Will it harm that humanity? You bet your life it will. 